Well, to kick off today, we have Don Segura and Stacy Collins uh, presenting a handful of librarians dance in the empty caverns of reactionary schools. So, thank you. Yeah. I promise we will explain what that means for anybody who doesn't know. And I'm sorry, I'm just going to see if I can pull up there's a scene that if I have a PDF, I'd like to show you all. Um, but hello, everybody <laughs> that I mostly already know. Um, how you all doing? We've got, got some of this food and some of this coffee and such. We've got coffee. Some of that chef. Yes? All right. Thank you, ALASC. <laughs> so how many folks are familiar with, well, let's, let's actually back up further than that. So do folks remember about two, three years ago when there was a lot of sort of instances in the news of student bodies or parts of student bodies bringing demands to their um, to their administration. Sometimes oh, yeah. it would be like, we specifically want this dude fire. Sometimes it would be, um, we need improvements in terms of the services that are offered here, et cetera, et cetera. Folks remember this? Yes. Yeah, it was happening all across the nation. Um, I do not remember which one was first. Um, but do you folks also know that Simmons was a member of this group? We did not end up in the news for reasons. Um, but we also, our student body also brought 10 demands, the undergraduates brought 10 demands um, to the administration, to our president and provost. Folks familiar with this in November yeah. 2015? Yeah. Yes? Awesome. Um, the 10 demands, which I'm pretty sure you can still Google. Um, There's a scene about it. There is a scene about it. Does anybody happen to have the same scene scene? Oh, it's on my desk. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, I'm, I'm actually, this is what I'm doing while I'm talking, is seeing if I can find it, because I also have. I can at least maybe show the cover. Yeah. Okay. That. Oh, you have the thing. You have it. Yeah. Because um, I scanned this in an attempt to uh, eventually put it online, which got derailed a little bit, but that's okay. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so. Okay. So this is the zine that the the folks who organized this and the majority of folks organizing this were affinity groups within. The um, uh, the undergraduate uh, student groups um, being led um, by the BSO, the Black Student Organization, um, and this is sort of a zine that they put together to document what happened. So the actual ten demands are in here. Lovely forward. They were great. So they started out by doing um, a very awesome sit-in that. Um, kept getting people, like they kept having to make the circle bigger and bigger and bigger inside common grounds, it was great. Uh, students showed up, graduate students showed up, faculty showed up for this, and everybody sat quietly and just formed this, this awesome circle. <coughs> um, <woo. laughs> um, and then the 10 demands were handed out, they did not make nearly enough copies um, because of how many people showed up in support of them. But they handed out copies of the 10 demands and they were read out loud. Um, and to their credit, our president and provost came, the, the plan was to go from this to the president's office and read the demands there, but to their credit, the president and the provost came to Common Ground so that they, the students didn't have to go anywhere. So they were read here uh, by the entire group of folks who were doing this in the park. Um, and then are they in here? All right, so this is probably my favorite part of the scene, but with all due respect, Ms. Conway, for folks who don't know, Katie Conway is our provost. Boo! <laughs> Boo! And that's, yeah, exactly. Um, so after this, there were a number of community gatherings to sort of discuss the demands, to discuss student experiences and what this, what the, the demands being brought to the administration was sort of about. Um, and our provost got up and essentially said, and what I'm sure she thought was a very like solidarity kind of move said, um, you know, we really want to address these issues, but we need your help, right? We, we don't know their issues until you tell us, da da da. To which a student immediately stood up, took up, took a mic, which was there for them, they didn't like rush the stage or anything, but took up a mic and said, with all due respect, Ms. Conboy, this is not the first time these demands have been brought, right? 50, year, 50 years ago. Um, a similar group of students of color came and gave very, very similar demands to the administration. So the notion that this was not an outcry that had been made was a very false idea that sort of uh, takes away accountability from the school. Um, and the scene that they put together was very much about documenting every single moment, well not every single moment, but the, very, the beginnings of this. Yes? So the actual demands are in here. Most of them relate to support services or support resources for students of color, and also um, hiring, more, like more representation on the faculty, et cetera, um, and just a lot of 
general common sense things that should already have been happening. Um, so they are, and even right now we are still working, the administration is working on meeting, meeting the 10 demands um, in, their, in their various ways. But after this happened, we had these community meetings where this awesome mic drop happened. Um, but there were more than that. They happened for, for months where a community meeting would happen sometimes uh, like once every two weeks, but at least there was at least one happening every month where discussions were happening. But the discussions mostly turned into venting sessions where the administration kind of wanted to talk their way, not out of the demands, but sort of like reframe them as like, oh, you know, you've mentioned this as a problem, but really it's this thing. And we actually can address this kind of easily. And students being like, no, we said what we said. This is a problem. Here's all the here's all the receipts I have as a student here, as a student of color here, um, as a marginalized student in other ways here. This is a problem that needs to be addressed intentionally and needs to be addressed without pretending that the problem is somehow different than what we're saying. And out of this came a lot of discussion from the students of not only what they were experiencing, but this double burden of I also have to prove that the oppression is happening. Right? So I have to, I, not only do I have to say, hey, racism just happened in my class, directed at me, but then everybody around me who I say this to wants to, number one, either know what racism is, or doesn't think that that's what racism is, and I gotta educate them on what that is, or they just don't think that what was said was actually racist, and I gotta go through and give all these receipts as to why. So essentially it was this double burden of not only being tokenized, um, or just generally, ostracized and marginalized within their classroom with by peers as well, but then also having this double burden of education. So, having attended a lot of these community meetings, which a lot of the librarians and folks did, sort of keeping an ear to the ground as they were sort of discussing their needs, um, because the 10 demands are higher education administration moves slowly. They just do. They're, they're built that way. They're built to move slow so that ideally, if it's a big thing, by the time they get around to doing anything about it, the people who want it to happen are already gone and graduated and they don't have to rush through anything. So that's whatever. So folks who were like, let's do some immediate things, we're, very, we're at these community meetings saying, what do students need right now, et cetera. So if, as a librarian or almost librarian at the time, um, I was like, all right, I hear an information need, right? Information need. Um, let's fill it. Um, so this idea of like, these folks should not have the responsibility of educating people, but it's also this mindset of like, if I don't do it, who's gonna? Um, so it's like, that's unnecessary. Let's create a resource uh, or resources that will sort of fill this gap. And let's also at the same time, not only are these students have double burdens, but they're also part of that is that they're not being heard, right? The fact that they have to stage a sit-in and then literally read out loud with a group of over 100 people these demands means they're not being heard otherwise. So finding a way to create educational resources that these folks can point to rather than having to educate others themselves, and also giving them an outlet and a space for their voices to be heard, but not just heard, to actually have impact. Um, and so out of this came two library resources, one of which is our anti-oppression guide, which is up on the interwebs right now, and the social justice scene collection. This is actually a page on the guide that highlights the collection. Um, these, these are the uh, anti-oppression baby animals. They're awesome and awesome crew. Right. But so here are, you can see, can, do folks see this okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so over here, we have a number of things. So there's the sim, the sim scenes, which is the documenting of the tiny bands. And then we have a lot of other social justice scenes which are about either highlighting topics um, that have to do with anti-oppression or just topics that are not talked about, right? So some of this is just the experience of living with invisible disabilities. Um, Dear White People is a very popular one up there talking about racism. Um, there's one that talks about beauty standards, etc. Beauty. Oh, yeah. Um, and all of these are authored by students? Yeah. yeah, so all of these are authored by students, most of them marginalized students, most of them writing about experiences that they actually live in every day. Um, do you want to talk about the, the Zoom and the, and the cataloging steps? Is the subject term? Yeah, you have to talk. I to talk. Yeah, so most of these zines are made by students in classes and we take their originals and they go upstairs to the archives of special collections and then what they describe their zine as in terms of subject headings actually impact our cataloging system. 
So for example, um, we did not have a subject heading for white privilege until Dear White People and Toxic Blackberry Manifesto uh, had that in their subject terms. And so that's actually changing the landscape of the way that we catalog zines here at Simmons and allowing the students to actually have a voice in how we categorize stuff. Um, the other thing that the Social Justice Zine Collection did in the beginning um, was provide free resources for students who were interested in going to protest or starting a protest or what their rights were if they were at a protest, um, how to stay safe, um, those kinds of things, how to also like protect yourself online. Um, knowing that when you're doing social justice work, you might not want other folks to know what you're doing. And so none of these zines were cataloged, and that meant that students could come and take what they wanted and leave with it, and we had no idea who took what. Um, I will say of the free stuff, the one that um, was most popular was um, Are You an Anarchist? And then the bottom, <coughs> then the bottom was like, I bet the answer will surprise you. And that was taken like every day. It was kind of awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All these little anarchists. And you can see, you can see from some of these, some of these categories up here, right? Not all of this is about like let's burn down the establishment. A lot of it is about folks getting the care that they need and understanding the systems that harm them every day, so that they can take care of themselves and the resources that they might have. Um, there's also things for folks who are trying to burn it down, but burn it down as safely for themselves as possible. Uh, ways to like do activism, do bystander intervention, and sort of push against the system in a sustainable, uh, in a sustainable and ultimately not destructive to themselves kind of way, which is great. So the social justice collection had this impact of giving student voices a place, marginalized student voices. Um, a place to be heard, to be seen, um, and to impact right their peers, right? So they don't need to actually do the, the emotional labor of talking to every single peer. Peers can come and find these things that they've made out of labors of love um, and still get the same message without burning out the folks who are trying to say the things. And, which is pretty much a general zine idea, right? Um, but also, this has, so, it had impact on the actual library itself, right? So this is not just student voices out here saying things, this is student voices having impact and making change. Um, so having, being able to change our subject terms, um, to use things that our normal cataloging systems don't include, is an impact in the way that the library does what it does. It's, the way, it's a, a way of making things discoverable that we didn't have access to before this existed. Um, and also, this has inspired a number of classes, well, this plus John going in talking in everybody's faces, um, has inspired a number of classes to use zines not only as reading assignments, like read this and gain information and talk about it, but also using zines as assignment assignments, like folks make zines as part of their course, um, as part of completing the learning objectives of their course. Um, so we've got like sociology courses where obviously this makes a lot of sense that it fits in, but I've also got um, my folks, the social work folks, are also using this um, as uh, a zines as a way of putting together information that's not a paper, right? So a little less, a little bit more creativity that you can put in here. Um, but also a way of presenting information in a more consumable way, right? So like social worker's job basically is to, you're working with a client, you go and look at all the literature of like, what's the best way to help this client with whatever they're, they're dealing with. And then you have to present everything that you found to them in a way that they understand. And also talk about why they do think it's the best, it's the best resources for them. Um, so creating zines is actually a way for them to practice that. So this, this collection has actually impacted the curriculum at Simmons, which is cool. So all the impact. All right. Less. <laughs> so the other half of this that I was talking about is the rest of the guide. So the social justice zine collection is actually like a physical collection. It's in the library. Even as we speak, ooh, that's big. Um, <laughs> It is big. It is Ooh, and I'm getting bigger. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. Okay. So this is the anti-oppression guide, which was sort of this, this other half, right? This educational resource that folks could point to instead of having to engage in that labor again, over and over again, of explaining that the harm you experience every day is no, it's not in your head. No, it's not made up. No, it actually is racism. It actually is uh, transphobia, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the guide that came out of it. Um, it's does 
not follow the rule for anybody who likes libguides or works with libguides or is wondering and wants to play around with them. This is not what guides are supposed to look like. It breaks all the rules of like user experience and usability. There's a lot of scrolling involved. It's so much. There's tons of links. This breaks all the rules in terms of a good guide. But what it is is just a big curated box of information for folks who are either at the start of they're learning about anti-oppression, or folks who are looking for more voices to follow, more discussions to sort of read about or be a part of. Um, so this is not a comprehensive guide, and I have there's so many disclaimers on this thing, of like, the way to use this is as a starting point, as a scaffold to be built out. The, 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 ooh, the areas of anti-oppression here, anti-racism, anti-transmysia, anti-ableism, anti-Islamismia, anti seen as an anti-queer visia, these are all areas that are conversations that are key here at Simmons. They are not all the ways that you can oppress people. New ways to oppress people are being invented every day, so the guide could not possibly hold all of them and have the, a sane person behind it. Um, but there's a couple, so there's other disclaimers on here as well, right? So the idea that the folks who created this guide are people, right? So they also sit at certain intersections of identity, some identities um, give them privilege in these systems. Some of them, they're oppressed in these systems, but they're going to be limited by their own perspectives, right? So this, this guide is not perfect. It, there's no way it could be. So like, it's always changing, always being updated, always being added to. Some things are deleted, etc. Um, and a good example of this is actually some of the titles here. So some of you may have been like, "What? What is transmisia? I don't. I don't know what that is." <laughs> um, so the shift in using a misia suffix instead of a phobia suffix is actually a great example of this. So initially the guide had transphobia and Islamophobia. They're very recognizable terms. They mean what they mean. Um, however, there's a ton of discussion about um, that's happening around this use of phobia, which is a real thing, right? There are actual humans who have phobias. They hopefully have resources and therapy to help them with them, but it's an irrational uh, response to some kind of stimulus, right? Claustrophobia being like really, really un uncontrollably um, disrupted by being inside a small space, yeah? Um, and so the problem with phobia and suffixes is, is that it conflates a very real condition, a very real mental health condition with bigotry, which is a choice um, and entire, entirely um, self-determined. So um, by moving to misia, which means, which is also Greek, so phobia is, is Greek for fear of, misia is Greek for um, hate or hatred of, right? So it's just generally more accurate, which we're always striving for, but it's also more inclusive, so we don't like harm or erase people with actual phobias when we say these things. So the guide is constantly changing and constantly updating. Um, dun, dun, dun. All right, so these things exist. They existed for a while, like, the, the social justice scenes were there before the Ten Commandments? No. Okay, so in November 2015, these things come in, like, sort of, or the ideas of them come into existence, they develop over time. It's now 2018, it's been a while, they've existed, they've been updating, they've been doing what they're doing. And then, <laughs> so who, how many folks are familiar with campus reform? Boo! Okay, tough, so a couple <laughs> folks right there. For anybody that's not, so campus reform is based, it's, so it's not really a publication, that's a, a very loose term, but they do write things and they do publish them on the internet. But it's a conservative, alt-right, neo-fascist, like conservative is actually kind of, like calling it conservative is actually a, and it's insulting to actual conservatives. Um, it's very much just a, a big publication that's a dog whistle for alt-right jerks, right? Um, they call themselves campus reform because they are trying to suss out the liberal influence in higher education, right? Higher, higher education institutions are just big pools of uh, liberal bias and indoctrination oh, yeah. techniques, yeah. <laughs> um, so, campus reform have, they, they tend to target marginalized folks, so right, so if a, if a professor of color, a faculty member of color uh, writes an article about some, like maybe a community that they share an identity with, or just talks about like the importance of diversity in education um, and pedagogy. Um, campus reform will find it, and if they think it's egregious enough, they will write about it. And their writing about it mostly consists of them quoting whatever it says, as opposed to actually saying anything about it. Um, but because the, their readers are just this big mass of neo-fascists, they know that they are signaling to their readership 
attack this person. This person is wrong, look at all their liberal awfulness, go and find them. And again, they mostly target marginalized folks. So, they suck. Um, however, in, what, early February uh, this year, campus reform stumbled upon uh, our, the guide, yeah? Um, and a bunch of weird things happened because of the, the way the guide was formatted and some of the information that was on it. Um, but suffice it to say, they tracked it down to our library and were like, we're going to write about this, and off they went. Now, again, they didn't actually say anything, right? They didn't say, look at this terrible guide, it's so ridiculous and liberal. They just say, this guide exists, but their readership is poised to be like, aha, now we can attack. Which they kind of did. So now, as a result, they, so they talked about our transmisia tab, and then talked about our Islamovizia attack. So we had angry cisgender people who were doing comments and ridiculousness and kind of terrible vitriol just being spewed all over the internet. And then we had angry Christians. Um, and, and like, again, I use Christian loosely because it's not super Christian values to like weaponize things like God bless you or Jesus loves you. That's not really, that's not really a Christian vibe. Um, but suffice it to say, these, <laughs> these, these pages um, sort of, they talk about, right, the privileged groups um, in, in direct, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the, the oppressed groups, right? So when we talk about transmisia, we talk about the experience of trans folks, but we also talk about the privilege of cisgender folks and things like cis fragility um, and the way that cis people sort of trample all over trans people. Um, and this angers the privileged group who doesn't want to do any self-reflection or, or anything like that. Um, or the really ridiculous folks who just think that trans people don't exist. Those are super fun. So now, after all of this thing, so the Islamomizia uh, article that they put out actually got picked up by Fox News, so this has been a fun, it's actually still happening, we're still getting responses, and it's super great. Um, but now if you Google Simmons College Librarians, <laughs> right? So first, you, you would normally get these things. This is actually what you would normally see, but now the immediate next <laughs> thing that pops up is campus reports. And then our Twitter, and then their second, their, the second one, right? Um, oh. Yeah, so super, super, super awesome. So what we decided, as, I, as we sat sort of at our desks, being like, looking at these comments, looking at these articles, and being like, they've just gotten this, like, I don't know if I'm more upset that they've targeted us, because like, part of me is like, haha, we pissed off the right people, fantastic, this means this is a good thing. But I'm the librarian in me, like the person who like values the, the good research, right, and, and citations and things like that, was like, you all suck at reporting. You have gotten so many things wrong. Uh, so, um, so Don and I sitting at our desk being like, these people are ridiculous, looking at sort of the Twitter responses to these articles and whatnot. We were like, we just kept seeing things. So Don eventually was like, I'm gonna go and collect these comments. I'm gonna go and make sort of like an archive and I'm gonna put them in a zine. Um, and then I started, res I started responding, not directly to folks, but like we would get like weird emails to just random people in the library. And so we just started like having fun responding to these as if we were talking to them, but just like with, to ourselves. So what we, what we ended up doing is this scene, which is where the title of our thing comes from. So the, the a handful of librarians dance in the empty caverns of reactionary skulls was actually a comment that was put on Twitter. And we were like, this is obviously the title of this. <laughs> So I'm going, to pass, I'm going to pass some of these around so you can take a look. So Dawn collected all, as many comments as she could that uh, were not like real, oh. egregious, awful, wishing bodily harm on us. <laughs> and then I went through and commented on them. So like sort of a, I guess sort of like a safe way to respond to these folks because obviously responding to them only adds like gasoline to the fire, but sort of having a nice cathartic move. So there's a little intro that sort of explains what the purpose of the zine was, but it was meant to be a bit of catharsis for us because we get to like speak back to all this terror. Because it's not every day that you have a bunch of terrible, hateful comments thrown at you for your work that you do, especially work that these folks found and kept describing as new. <laughs> you know, Simmons College librarians have a new guy talking or talking about new microaggressions, and it's just like. No, like, no, microaggressions have existed forever, number one. Also, these resources have been out for a while, but it's like, they didn't exist until we found them. So it was just like, there's just so much that we're like, bottling up, it's like, this was nice to sort of like, let it out, and um, almost like a journal exercise, it's great. Um, but also, as the intro sort of says, this is also anti-oppression in action, right? This is when you take hateful, misinformed, 
comments that frame oppression as somehow not existing or somehow the fault of the oppressed or anything like that, and you speak back to it. You say, no, you're wrong. <laughs> like, here, and here's exactly how you're wrong. The fact that these people exist means that you're wrong. The fact that these people exist and all people that exist deserve to be treated like people is, is how you're wrong. Um, so there's a fun theme of skulls that runs through this. Um, also a couple of memes that I'm particularly proud of. Um, so, yes, yeah, so this so this is, and actually this is where we are today. Like we, this scene is just some, something that we just put together. We continue to get responses from these folks, but we also continue to see these resources used at Simmons and also used outside of Simmons. I'm gonna, I'm actually, let me, let me see if I can pull this up. So a number of folks have borrowed our guide. Like officially borrowed. That's the way the Live Guides platform works. Is they they ask for my permission just in case, and then they through the platform they can actually copy the entire the entire guide or any pieces of it that they wish. So let me see if I can find some of them. Entire question. Okay. So there's ours, right? And that's, these are a couple of pages that are ours. But then we have some some other places, right? So the New York Institute of Technology has borrowed some of our resources, some of our definitions, um, some of the, the links and stuff that we posted to make available to their students. Um, da, da, da. Uh, the University of Nevada in Las Vegas, same deal. They borrowed tons of resources from us, definitions, videos, um, links to discussions, um, and even some language, right? So not a lot, anti-oppression was not something we talked about a lot. It's still not something we talked about a lot. We talked about diversity and inclusion which is not, not quite it, right? It's good, but it's not quite it. And now suddenly we've got live guides coming out of libraries that are talking about anti-oppression and maybe um, <coughs> sort of getting folks to ask questions about like, what is that? Why, how is it different? Why does it matter? Um, let's see, who else has one? Ooh. Sorry. Um, so yeah, so these have, these have popped up in, in a number of places. <laughs> And it's fun because we get credited. Um, some folks have actually borrowed the whole thing. So um, Leslie University, woo, Leslie University. Okay, I can't type and talk. Has actually borrowed the entire guide. They actually need to borrow it again because the guide has changed since they copied it. Um, but it, by copying it, it allows them to sort of tweak the pieces they need, right? So instead of Simmons, it says Leslie. Um, they they may have changed some of the language, etc. So this is actually you can actually this is actually sort of like an archive, right? This is an earlier version of what our guide looked like a lot. As you can see, the language was different. There were fewer tabs. So the guide has grown. The guide has changed. And eventually, um, my colleague Sam over at Leslie will probably recopy this so that the, the new guide will be will be presented to the Leslie folks as well. But like this has impact, right? So student concerns, student voices. There's a lot of our own faculty's writing. Um, there's scholarly writing in here. Um, eventually, I will put the sim scenes and some, uh, hopefully some of the other um, zines that students have created and make them available online here through the guide. So, like, we have student impact within the library, within Simmons, changing the curriculum, changing the way the library does business, but then also outside, right? So, folks are folks have access to this guide; it's just freely on the internet. Um, and student concerns, but also what students are saying about oppression, about pushing back against these systems, are also making their way out to. Other libraries, this is also, well not this one, but ours, our guide is uh, a resource that I bring up when I do uh, uh, anti-oppression trainings or equity education workshops. Um, so it has impact here in other libraries that are not us, um, and also outside of librarianship, which is pretty cool. And it means that a bunch of people get to see really cool zines, which is also awesome. Any questions? Y'all are lit. <laughs> That's not a question. <laughs> we are tabling, well I am tabling with that zine tomorrow. Um, and oh yes, you want to tell them about that. Any of the monies that we get for it will be split between the Southern Poverty Law Center and the Trevor Project. Yes. So, so the two places that probably will piss these folks off the most. So their, their <laughs> terrible hateful comments that were meant to be like, I don't know, undermine the, the usefulness of both of these resources and the zines, etc. Is now going to produce money that goes to organizations that shut them down. So that's cool. Yeah. yeah. Woo! Yes. And I, I really want to make a T-shirt with that with that title. The the reactionary spell, the cavern of reactionary spell. I also want to visit the cavern of reactionary spell. <laughs> <laughs> so beautiful. Right. <laughs> 
We should we should take an actual picture in an actual cover. So I should, we should also say that this is the zine that you have in front of you is the second version of this scene. The first edition that we did was mm, a little raw. -er. It was a little like for instance, instead of hateful comments, um, these the the comments were labeled a different, more expletive label. It um, said fuck stick. Yeah, which is more, <laughs> more <accurate. laughs> But it's like, but it's also one of those things. It's like that's your knee jerk reaction. It's like you are terrible people, et cetera, et cetera. But not the thing is, not all of these comments are necessarily terrible people. They're literally people who don't know. Now, does that excuse them from hateful comments or any of that junk? Absolutely not. Does it excuse them from the impact and the harm they do to oppressed groups? Absolutely not. But the impulse that, the, ideally, the impulse that we have is, no, no, you need to be quiet, which is sort of what the zine is. It's like you're wrong, you need to be quiet. And then, like, let's talk about why you're wrong. Like, if you're, you know, this is this is something you need to relearn. If you prove that you're unwilling to relearn, then you know we don't really have time for you. But if you're willing to relearn and think about this, right? Because some folks were literally like, "What is this word?" That was their comment. Like, "What is this word?" It's like, well, you know, the guy has a definition. If only you had actually clicked on the thing that campus reform was talking about, and you got so excited about. So, like, there are folks who are just sort of reacting like, "This is a new thing, and I don't like it." It's like, "All right, well, calm down," and then shut up. And deal with it and learn the new thing. Intake new information. That's how the world works, right? You share the planet with these people, you'll learn about them. Yeah. Yeah? So the guide will be, it'll be available tomorrow at the, or today? Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You're tabling tomorrow? Yeah, or maybe. Yes. Tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Tabling tomorrow. So if you ultimately would like, if you'd like a copy or if you just generally would like to make a donation to either the Trevor Project or to the Property Law Center, please do stop by.